Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody back, and uh, we trust you've... Uh, I think they just about drained that coffee pot. I couldn't even get a cup a little while ago. Anyhow, it's good to have you all back in here, and uh, we'll be going right back where we were in Hebrews chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 14. And again, for those of you joining us on television, in case you're a new listener, we are just an informal, independent Bible study. We uh, hope not to build a big organization or anything like that. We just want to open the Scriptures for whoever you are, wherever you are. And uh, again, we always like to thank you for your letters, your prayers, and of course your financial help, but whatever. We just trust that the Lord will use us to open the Scriptures to your understanding. My, it thrills our heart to see so many lost people coming to a knowledge of salvation, but many, many more believers who have never had an understanding of the Scriptures are finally getting their eyes opened up. In, uh, in fact, I was listening to a tape the other night by a seminary president, and I won't name the denomination because I'm not in that business of attacking anybody. But he said what I've said so often, privately and in my classes, that in his denomination, that's what he was talking about, he said, most of our people are so ignorant. Well, you know, ignorance is not a lack of brain power. Ignorance is a lack of teaching. And so many people are willfully ignorant. They don't want to learn. And uh, consequently, uh, they've got a lot of misconceived ideas. But hopefully we're, we're getting through to a lot of those people, and uh, we uh, are so thrilled as we travel and go on these seminars where people will come up and tell us that they're so grateful that the Scriptures have been opened up to their understanding. All right, I think uh, they probably announced at the end that all the programs are available on video, audio tapes, and little books, so we'll just let it go at that. All right, let's go right back where we want to leave off and get going, and that's in Hebrews chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to read verse 13 again and as we get ready for 14. But Paul writes to these Hebrews. Now, don't forget that we're addressing primarily a Hebrew congregation, wherever they are, and the people are in a battle to make a clean break with Judaism and come over into this doctrine of grace, which is by faith plus nothing, and without any attachment to the law and temple worship and so forth. So always remember that that's first and foremost the people we're dealing with, but as I said earlier today, we can also glean so much that apply to us, even as church-age believers. All right, so verse 13, the verse we looked at in our last half hour, exhort one another daily, not just once a week on Sunday, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, your day of opportunity, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now remember, he's talking to people that are involved in a religious system. Now if you doubt when I call Judaism a religious system, back up with me to Galatians, honey. Go back to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul is reviewing his own past. Galatians chapter 1. Let's just start at verse 11. Because I never say any of these things to put any one group down or to, what should I say, make any snide remarks or anything like that, but it's just based on Scripture that the Judaism of which these people were still a part was indeed a religion. And of course we maintain that Christianity is not a religion. A religion is comprised of works and things that you have to do, whereas our salvation is by faith and faith alone. All right, Galatians 1 verse 11, and Paul, of course, is rehearsing his going into the ministry. So he says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now here it comes. For you have heard of my conversation, or manner of living, in times past, in the Jews' religion. 
See that? And how that beyond measure I persecuted the church or the assembly of God and wasted it. Now verse 14, he says it again. And I profited in the Jews' religion. Okay? So now when I come back to Hebrews and I use the word, hopefully I'm on the right track, that these people were still half in the religion of Judaism, but they were also contemplating, and some of them had completely embraced Paul's gospel of what we call the age of grace. So they're on the fence. Now consequently, when I come down to verse 14, I'm going to use the little two-lettered word, I, F, if, and it doesn't make any reflection on our losing the salvation that we once had, but it's dealing with these people who are battling the complete break with their religion and stepping into this whole economy of grace. It's not a matter of their being saved and lost, it's a matter of making a break with that which withholds their whole salvation. All right, now I'll come back to it again later. So he says again, Exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, or as we said in the last half hour, lawlessness, complete rejection of the things that God had laid out. Now verse 14, 4, we are made partakers of Christ. In other words, when we come into the body of Christ, we're not like a subject of a king, we are a member of the head who is in heaven and of which we are the body. Now I guess I should stop right there. Well, we're not going to get very far today, are we? I thought I was going to get way into chapter 4. Goodness. Come back with me to uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Starting at verse 12 because this ties in so perfectly with what he says here. We are partakers of Christ by the power of the gospel, of course. But now look what that means. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For as the body, our human body, is one, but it has many members. Now what does that speak of? Our hands, fingers, toes, ears, eyes, all of these things make up our body. And all the members of that one body, being many, yet they're one body. So also is Christ, or the body of Christ. Now here it comes, verse 13. For by one Spirit, by the work of the Holy Spirit, we are all, not just some of the elite, not just some who have had a particular experience, but every believer is baptized or placed into one body, which Ephesians calls the body of Christ. That composition of believers from wherever they are, whatever their station in life, at salvation they are brought in and become part and parcel of the body of Christ. Now some of us may be a little toe. Some of us may be nothing more than an ear or an eye or something like that, but we're members of the body. And we have a function. That's why it behooves every believer to be used of God in whatever particular purpose he has. All right, so here we are, placed into the body by the work of the Holy Spirit, whether we be Jew, or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and we have been all made to drink or partake in that one spirit for the body. The human body as well as the body of Christ is not one member, but many. And so the whole analogy of the rest of this chapter is that God is building the body of Christ individual by individual, placing them where He wants them, just like, and I've used this analogy over and over through the years on the program and in my classes, like the little baby in the mother's womb. My, that doesn't just form all at once, but over nine months, those cells are going to their rightful place. 
The cells that compose the fingernails go to the fingernail. The cells that compose the eye go to the eye. And all through that nine month period, that little body is finally brought to a completion. Every cell has gone to where it has to be to make that little creature function. All right, so is the body of Christ. Now for 1900 and some years, God has been bringing them in one at a time, one at a time. Now you know I'm a farmer and I've used the exa example before. You go into a grain bin, I don't care whether it's wheat or corn or whatever, I, I was a corn farmer. Now more than once I would stand at the top of that huge 10,000 bushel bin and I would just be amazed. That whole bin was full of individual what? kernels. Individual kernels. And you follow that kernel all the way back to when it was being formed in the ear, what were they? They were individual kernels, formed on the ear, finally taken off and mixed in with the total. And yet, every kernel is an individual. Oh, it so is the body of Christ. We've never lost our individuality. And God knows every one of us as an individual, and yet the composite is the body of Christ will one day be complete, and that's why I'm a proponent of the rapture. We have to be taken out. We will not fit in the tribulation economy, the best word I can find, because the tribulation is for Israel and for the unbelieving world. The tribulation isn't for the believers. The body of Christ has to be taken out, and it will be. I'm adamant on that. And every book and article that people send me, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, all I have to do is leaf through and the first thing I'll see, there is not one reference to Paul's epistles. Not one. They'll quote everything from the Old Testament, they'll quote the four Gospels, they'll quote early Acts, they'll quote the Revelation, but they avoid Paul like a plague. Well, no wonder they come up with their crazy ideas. Because Paul alone tells us about the forming of the body of Christ. Paul alone tells us how the body is to function in this world. Paul alone is going to give us the end of the body on earth and its deliverance. See that? All right, so here we have then, as we find coming out of Hebrews, let's go back there again, that the body of Christ is being formed because as we became believers of the gospel, we became partakers or companions of Christ by virtue of the fact that the Holy Spirit has placed us into the body. What a unique position. What a unique position to be a member of Christ himself. We're not just subjects of a king. Well, he's going to be king of kings. Don't think for a minute he won't be. But we're not the subjects of a king. We're members of the body of Christ. All right, back to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. So we are made partakers of Christ. And there's that big word I made mention of earlier. If. Oh, that scares so many people. I get letters. Well, what about this in Hebrews? And what about that in Hebrews? Doesn't that mean that if I do something particularly wrong, I'll lose my salvation? Well, you know, the first thing I have to ask people, does the Bible tell you what sin will take you out? You ever thought about that? Well, I had a gentleman come up with me when I first started teaching outside of my own particular church. And if he hears the program, he'll be able to tell his wife, hey, that was me. <laughs> because he came up one night and he said, well, now I'm in a denomination that is always taught you could be saved and lost and saved and lost. But now he says that I know I'm saved. He said, the first thing I realized, how were we supposed to know what sin took us out? Have you ever thought of that? What sin took me out so that I have to get saved again? Well, nobody knows. And so it almost becomes ridiculous. And so the word if here is not a matter of these Hebrews having been saved and losing it. They've not totally entered in. They're on the fence. They're considering it. And we get to chapter 6. I'll probably spend a whole four uh, half hours on that one. But in chapter 6, again, it's impossible if you've been enlightened. It doesn't say it's impossible if they've been saved. But they've only been enlightened. They've tasted. They've stepped in one foot. And then what'd they do? 
They turned around, they went back into Judaism. Now, I've had the same problem with, especially, people in cults, as we call them. I'm not going to name them, but there are more than one. And they have the same problem. Oh, it's so hard to break with that cultic brainwashing that they've been under for maybe 50, 60, 70 years, see? And it isn't that they're going to be saved and lost, it is, it's because they can't truly come in and experience a real rebirth salvation. And so that's what we're dealing with here in Hebrews. Don't ever get the idea that we're talking about Hebrews who were saved and lost, or that if they can hang on, they'll still be saved. No, the if is, have you really been saved? And this is where I'm, I'm probably shaking a few people up. And now, I don't want to make people miserable and doubt their salvation if they've truly been saved. Not at all. But listen, we've got jillions of people out there who think they're saved and they've never had a salvation experience. And those are the people that we have to warn. Yes, this if is a big if for you. For we are made partakers if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. In other words, if salvation is real, if salvation has been totally completed by that act of God, it can never end. It can never be taken away. Because that's an act of God, and I've said it over and over over the years. Stop and think of all that God does, not what we do. But think of all that God does the moment He saves us and sees our faith. He justifies us. He forgives us. We've already seen in 1 Corinthians, He places us into the body. He redeems us. He pays the purchase price. He justifies us. He sanctifies us. He glorifies us. He puts the Holy Spirit within us. Should I keep going? <laughs> Can God undo all that? No way. God will not, or He wouldn't be the God of His Word. And so the whole if problem is, have they been genuinely saved? Or have they merely tasted? Have they considered it, but in their heart they're still saying, uh, I can't quite buy this. All right, so now then, let's go on to verse 15. So while it is said again today, during this age of grace, this day of opportunity, today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart. That goes back again into the previous verse. What hardens hearts? Sin. Sin. And who's at the head of the sin business? Satan. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, chapter 4. 2 Corinthians, chapter 4. 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians, chapter 4. 3 and 4. <clears throat> All got it? But if our gospel be hid, in other words, of no use, <clears throat> it is hid to them that are lost. They're still in their lawlessness. They're still in their sin. All right, verse 4. And in these people who are still in their lawlessness, in these people, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of them who, oh, what's the word? Believe not. Isn't that simple? Doesn't say a word about all the sins of the flesh that we mentioned in the last program. No, that's not their problem. That's just the result of their unbelief. But the opposite of unbelief is belief, faith. See? All right, read on. So the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the visible image of the invisible God, remember, out of Colossians 1, 
lest the image of Christ, or let the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So who keeps people in their darkness? Well, Satan does. And how does Satan do it? By keeping them involved in their sin. Now, can you see why we got a problem today? My, our kids are hooked on the videos and the TV programs that are nothing but rot and smut, nothing but destroys their character, their thinking. No wonder it's so hard to get through to them. And the only way, evidently, churches think they can get them is use the world's approach. I still can't agree to it, but whatever, more and more go in that way. But whatever, the problem is they have been blinded by the deceitfulness of sin. All right, back to Hebrews for just a second, and then I want to come back to Romans again, so be ready for a quick jump. Back to Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 15. So while it is said today, if you will hear His voice. All right, how do we hear the voice of God? How do we hear it? Well, Romans. Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10. Verses I'm sure you know and you'll recognize them as soon as we start. Starting in verse 13. <clears throat> Romans 10, verse 13. For whosoever, none accepted. This is an invitation to the whole human race. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. All right, now then the question is, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? In other words, how can they become believers of someone they know nothing of? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher, or I know the Greek has a better definition, I think, proclaimer. Someone that proclaims the truth. How can they hear without a proclaimer? Verse 15, how shall they proclaim or preach except they be sent? Now who's involved? Well, God, the Holy Spirit, see? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach or proclaim the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, regardless of what good news it was. Now you want to remember, when Abraham believed God, he didn't believe the gospel as we understand it. He didn't believe that Christ would die and be buried and rose from the dead. How could he? It hadn't happened. But he believed what God said and what God tell him, leave her and I'll make of you a great nation. And Abraham, Romans 4 says, believe God. That's all. He believed God. And what God do? Called him a righteous man. Just on the basis of his faith. That's where we get my little cliche, faith plus nothing. Began with Abraham. It dropped out of sight for centuries, but now in the age of grace it comes back again. And we like Abraham are saved by faith plus Nothing. So how do we hear it? Well, you have to have someone proclaim it. We have to have the Holy Spirit behind it. All right, now then verse 17. Here is the answer to our dilemma. <clears throat> for faith, believing, taking God at His word. For faith cometh by what? Hearing. You've got to hear it to understand it. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. That's why we've got this book. That's why God gave it to us. That's why you don't have to put your Bible on the shelf and say, well, I'll just wait for the preacher to tell me. No. You may have to have someone explain some of these things to you, which is pertinent, but you've got the Word of God in your hands. Search the Scriptures, see? and see if these things are true. All right, so then faith, verse 17 again, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And it's only the Word of God that can bring salvation to the human race. And again, I guess I should use that verse that I've referred to hundreds of times, I think, in this program, Acts. 
Go back to Acts. <clears throat> Some of you already know where I'm going to go. Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> Acts chapter 16. And Paul is up there in the area of northern Greece. <clears throat> Today's Macedonia, which is in the news again every day. He's up in northern Macedonia in the city of Philippi. Now verse 13. And I think it's apropos for every believer to pray the same thing that I do on the basis of this verse. Lord, give us Lydia's. All right, here it is. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God. See, she had a certain amount of religion, but she didn't have salvation. And she heard us, whose, now here it comes, whose heart. Who opened it? The Lord did. Whose heart the Lord opened so that she attended to the things which were spoken by Paul. Now analyze that verse. Had not the Lord opened her heart, even a man like the Apostle Paul, would he have gotten through to her? No way. No way great preacher, evangelist, missionary that he was. Had the Lord not opened her heart, she would have been just as lost the next day as she was the day before. But God intervened and opened her heart. Now, if we had time, I think maybe we have. Let's go back to Matthew 16. Let's go back to Matthew 16. We'll have to do this quickly. I think time is going. We're down to a minute. All right, and here we have Jesus dealing with the Twelve, and we have Peter's confession of his faith. Matthew 16, verse 16. Matthew 16, verse 16. All got it? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now look what Jesus said. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood hath not revealed that unto thee, but how did Peter understand that Jesus was the Christ? God opened his understanding. See, God did. And so never forget that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.